Hi, greetings. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our afternoon session with Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon uh, for my discussion this afternoon with Sonia Dumas. Before we begin, I'd like to express huge thanks to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this series a reality and really making these salons happen. Um, before I begin, please feel free, uh, just so you know, to ask your questions, which we'll get to in the question and answer period, which will be coming in about at, uh, let's say, 4.45. So feel free throughout to send your questions to the chat as, you, as we go forward in our conversation this afternoon. So today we have Sonia Dumas, who is a performer, choreographer, writer, filmmaker, teacher, and arts development consultant who lives in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, she is a founder of Continuum Dance Project and initiator, co-founder, and co-director of Coco Dance Festival. Um, she also is very much rooted aesthetically in the historical and contemporary phenomena of this region. So it's wonderful to have this moment to explore with her, um, her own kind of creative practice and development over the last uh, few decades. Okay, so over to you, Sonia, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm yeah. so happy to be here. I mean, this is just wonderful. Yeah. You know, Caribbean people can talk to each other in different ways, this is great. Uh, it's fantastic, and it's wonderful to have you uh, this afternoon and to just have this opportunity to share and to delve a bit deeper in the Caribbean that unites us all, right? And, and yes. using arts as that, as that uh, pivot through which we exactly. begin to engage. Exactly, exactly. Wonderful. wonderful. A lot so, of us here say that arts are one of the essential services you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it, a it gets us through. It gets us through. It gets us it through. Gets the through. It's been our our steady companion, our exactly. real steady companion. So I was hoping that you were able to connect um, earlier to our conversation with this young, dynamic uh, dancer, performer, choreographer from from Saint Martin, Jonathan Van Ameren. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I just find it such a, a wonderful moment in terms of looking at the now in terms of what people are doing in other island spaces, in spaces with different colonial histories. And we know the island in which you hail from have a, a very colorful colonial past as well mm -hmm. uh, that has shaped a very dynamic cosmopolitan space and history and identity. Yes. And so um, if you could just speak a little bit about the space of Trinidad and Tobago. It's very, the very cosmopolitanness of it, it's diversity mm -hmm. um, and how that has uh, helped you position yourself in terms of your creative practice. And then we'll move into some other things as we go forward. When I think about Trinidad and Tobago, I think about the word access because, because of our sort of, you know, it's a sort of, hackneyed word multicultural, but because of our multicultural kind of dynamic, something that we've acknowledged, you know, many moons ago. Um, I mean, it's all the rage now, but I mean, you know, for centuries, that is what our sort of psyche was built on in a sense. Right. And I, in terms of that, access to different cultures, like just one block away from each other, kind yeah. of thing is what is what I think is so rich and, and empowering for us and the, the fact that even in our food in our in our in, in sort of day-to-day -day engagement with each other it doesn't even have to be in an artistic space there's so many uh, different sets of of imagery coming to us there's so many different sets of options coming to us mm -hmm. that, they, 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 that they, the plate is full and so we take, yes, you know, and we take from any part of the plate and make it ours. And oh. um, I think that that is one of the most sort of enriching uh, moments for me as a dancer, a dance maker, that I can go to different, I can pull from different things and they all feel very comfortable and they're not foreign, they're not alien to me on, on that level because I live it with other people in the space. Right. So I think for Trinidad and Tobago, that's that's quite a quite a phenomenon for us. Right, and I think that very diversity, that very multiplicity of of cultures that share space, mm -hmm. creates a particular type of artist. I find um, 
I find many uh, creatives that I've met in Trinidad straddle multiple spheres of the creative kind yes. of continuum, yes. right? It's as though that access and agility has given you license without even having to question it, a certain license to not just dabble, but really invest and engage in, in multiple idioms to bring forth the message that you have. And you yourself straddling, uh, I wouldn't even call it a divide because you don't make it seem that way, but straddling <laughs> uh, the spheres of film and, and dance. And so when you when you said a dance maker, I was like, well, she's also a filmmaker. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of, <laughs> you know, that, that yes. certain accordion-like elasticity. Yes. And so, um, you can, yes. you can just think about what brought you to film. Um, or I don't know where, which which where you started first. Perhaps they started. No, definitely kind of dance. I, I I started in dance, and um, you know, from a very young age. Yeah, um, with I love that whole movement thing. You know, even when I was a very young child, maybe five or whatever. I think that was where I went to. Right. But what I find in 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 film is the ability to amplify movement a lot of the time in a way that I maybe won't do it on a, a stage. Mm. Uh, and so a lot of my films have to do with dance, um, yes. uh, either dance history or their experimental films or their films that I kind of build on the rhythm of my own choreographic process. Because mm. I always say I choreograph films because I came to, to, to choreography and to dance first. You're so right. that I take the rhythm of that or my approach to the rhythm and try to, to build that into the rhythm of the film. Yeah. And um, I, I, just, I just like the aesthetic. It's something that appeals to me to, to look through a lens and to see how I can shape a story. Um, it's the same thing that I do on, on stage. You shape a story, but then you, you, you're working in three dimensions on the stage. Right. You're working in two dimensions in film, ultimately. Right. Um, and so that that I like that sort of challenge about having to work in that in those different dimensionalities. Yeah, because one of the things, one of the questions that I I was um, thinking of, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, we we're going to bring up the first image. But one of the questions mm -hmm. I was thinking of for you was, you know, this level of your corporal self, and how does your corporal self as a dancing being and a creator of movement um, inform, impact your cinematic eye? in terms yes. of what you bring to, to our own lenses and what you allow us to, to see. Yes. You know, is, are you also, uh, do you move behind the camera? Are you holding the camera? Are you seeing the choreography <laughs> unfold? So I'm just interested in this kind mm -hmm. of relationship between the corporal, the corporal and the cinematic for you. Right. Well, a lot of my, uh, approach to my dance practice is that you go into a kind of structured improvisation first. And so when I'm, I have a sort of plan when I get to the space of film, when I'm filming something that has to do with dance or movement, but I have that space where anything could happen and I let the dancers know that. Mm -hmm. There are very few times where I have very rigid choreography for the screen that might happen more on the stage than it does on the screen because on the screen, because you can take the, the your camera allows you to zoom in or to, to come in to a space or to a, a very sort of what you call in the film world an extreme close up, for instance, in the right. way that the dance that is on a stage doesn't. So that you can, that you don't want to miss those moments. So I keep it very open because there might be some flick of the skirt or something that I, you know, I'm like, wow, do that again. Let me just get that again. Mm. So I take that little piece and then the, the skirt starts to dance on the screen in the way that complements the dancer for the next shot. Right, right, right. So right. that um, you have to be open to those moments where right. the, the universe is giving you this gift. So take it. <laughs> I see that. And you know, what, what I love about, you know, your, even your, your politics and, and the way in which the environment and its conservation mm -hmm. is so deeply um, important to you and how film allows you to really situate it up in, uh, up in center. So even in that last image with this, this beautiful frame of this 
this draping uh, train of dress in the midst of all of this vegetation with the water in the distance and this kind of sense where as Caribbean bodies, as brown and beige and black bodies, we occupy and inhabit this, this incredible vegetated space. Yes, you know? yes. It's, it's, um, quite, it's quite beautiful. And we, we often take it for granted because it's all around us all the time. Mm. But believe me when I say, and I'm sure you've, you've, you've experienced this as well, people who are outside of the region in temperate um, situations or in arid situations or so are always absolutely inundated with senses right. of, of, oh my God, it's so green, it's so lush, it's so this. And um, it's a beautiful, it's a blessing to be in a space like that. Yeah, know, that we often take it for granted. Yes, yeah. yes, but it's really a blessing. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm reminded, um, Jonathan, his reflection this afternoon, early afternoon, was speaking about, you know, the sea all, all around him, that you can't be in St. Martin and not have, you know, the sea all around. And you in a petrol state, you yes. know, a, a more urban space. Yes. But the, there are spaces in Trinidad and, and certainly in Tobago where the sea is all around. But I wanted to hear a bit more from you about uh, the, the sea and, and water, uh, the, the saline waters or sweet waters, what it means for you um, in your own kind of, uh, for your own exploration within your creative practice. I think the sea and bodies of water in general play a tremendous role in my work because it's choreographic work either on screen or off. Because again, living in this space, you are confronted by the seas, those big bodies of water. You're not only the water, but the histories within that water. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that it becomes a space of so much memory, but so much creation as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also how the body moves because of it. How do we flow through our own lives because the, the rivers and the seas are flowing around us? And again, it may not be something that we take into consideration every moment of every day, but I'm certain that it, it affects us in some way because we are island people for the most part in the Caribbean. Some are not island people, but still, they are still around the sea. Yeah. And, um, I had a Kenyan uh, friend who is a choreographer um, from Kenya, and he says, do you feel isolated in an island? I mean, you know, it's only sea around you. And I'm like, I feel completely the opposite. Right. I think that all the possibilities in the world are available to me because I can go. I can see where the horizon is. I can see where possibilities lie. Right. And he was fascinated by that concept because he thought I was, I would, I would feel so isolated because it's a sort of, um, I guess, attitude or, 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 or assumption that if that an island is isolating and for right. me an island is expansive oh completely, um, completely. and uh, so th that is where I really realized that was years ago and I realized you know I really love where I live <laughs> mm -hmm. indeed indeed and that ability to have it accessible and to work with it on different on different levels. Right? Exactly. Do you do site specific work within this at in at the spaces of bodies of water? Most definitely. And some of my dancers, they know me, and you know they're like, "Oh God, do we have to get there for six o'clock in the morning?" I'm like, "Yes, we do," <laughs> because we I want a certain light. Yeah, and that's what comes at six o'clock in the morning. So we, we 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 go to some space, you know, some beach or whatever, and we do experimental work and that kind of thing. We have people looking at us strangely sometimes, but that's okay um, because that is um, that's part of the process. And you know, they they're fascinated. People look at us. What are those people doing um, uh, as they walk along the beach? They're not fisherwomen. Then what are they? Kind of thing. Um, but they stop and they look and they ask questions which I think is one of the important parts about art. You know, you, if you're making art for yourself, that's fine. If you're making art for others, if you're trying to bring others into the process, answer their question, bring them into the picture. And, um, you know, if, if because they're curious, they don't know. Right, um, so to so include them in Exactly, in the process. Creative process, exactly. 
Wow. Um, in terms of your dancers, are they, um, would you say, because I, I know quite a few uh, choreographers and artistic directors in the region from the late um, uh, Eduardo uh, Rivera in Cuba, mm -hmm. um, and you know the late Professor Rex Nettleford, uh, looked to the streets and looked to what we would call regular bodies, people right. in their stance and in their day-to-day -day activity mm -hmm. to find dancers. You mm -hmm. know, and I'm wondering in terms of your process how, how do you include bodies that may not have gone through the same rigors of training and then and then kind of uh hone them into the kind of dancer you're looking for or is it there a mixture of the kind of dancers you work with um in terms of uh placing your work on but the, yes well the core of my company are really trained dancers they're classically trained um in ballet modern um, but they're also classically trained in Trini. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. So they could, they need to be able to whine. You have they to be able to whine to be in the company. company. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, they quite they understand my process that my process is different. A lot of the time, I I bought on dance theater because mm. a lot of my, a lot of my work, as, as you mentioned before, you know, you observe the, the fact that there's politics in the work. So I would address the environment or the status of women or, the, you know, this uh, sort of uh, desperate need to, to have all the latest beauty products or what have you in the work. And um, a lot of the time I go to text for that as well. Yes. So that not everybody has to be you know absolutely trained at a certain level or what have you in terms of formal dance training but I think it's more of the attitude okay right. how do you approach the work that I'm trying to do um, I call the dance company my dance company continuum dance project because it's a continuum of people so I have people ranging from ages say 19 or 20 to 50 something that's the first thing Okay, it's a lot, it's a it's a very wide range of ages. Wonderful. It's a very it's a very wide range of philosophical approaches. A lot of the times oh, after yeah. rehearsal, we sit down and discuss politics. Right. Discuss right. an issue that 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 irks us or that has brought has you know we've it's been brought to our attention or what have you. Because I think that's really part and parcel of how we approach the work. Right. You see? And where does history and memory fit into this continuum for you? For is me, there... yes, there is a very, um, I can't really separate my work from the history of the region. And that's why the sea, as I said, is so important because the sea is what brought such deep transformations from the time that the first peoples were here. Even when the first peoples were here by themselves, right. um, they, uh, Tra traverse the region across the seas. So mm -hmm. the sea comes back to the location of history of the region. Wow. And um, I think that's why I'm so preoccupied with it in a sense, because I, I see so much, there's so much to mine there. There's so Indeed. much to figure out still. Mm -hmm. um, be, and then how, as I said, do we embody that? So the embodiment comes to, comes to sort of link to the history. It's like, what is it in our DNA, psychic DNA, physical DNA, what have you? Spiritual, that, emotional. Exactly, <laughs> spiritual, emotional, that has to do with our histories. We mm. have a colonial history. We have a pre-colonial history as well. Okay? Indeed. And we have a post-colonial one. So how, how do these things intersect to, to bring us to our contemporary moment? And how, mm. do, we, how do we contend with those, those issues through the body, so that my, my medium is the body or the lens. That's, yeah. that's how I look at it. Beautiful. And speaking of the contemporary and your, and your engagement with this moment, mm -hmm. I, I'm really excited about the work that you're doing with youth and mm -hmm. also uh, the work that you're doing in terms of building bridges uh, to, to bring different collectives, different bodies, different communities together through your Coco Dance Festival, Contemporary Dance Festival. Uh, would you mind, uh, I want 
bringing up one of the images we have um, that explores uh, a stage piece. And I, if you could speak a bit about yes. what was the, the, the kind of catalyst for creating this dance festival and also what does the contemporary mean for you when, we, when you're reflecting on the contemporary and right. youth culture? Right. Well, we started the festival, um, some choreographer friends and myself started it in 2009 uh, because we felt that there was such a need at that time for young people to express themselves. We had just started, I had just started along with uh, another colleague, the dance program at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And we felt that there was not enough opportunity for the, actual, for the young people to actually perform, feel their own creativity. So we, can, we, we made this festival for the young um, students, of, the, students of, the, of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, of the University of the West Indies, for them to apply to the festival to, with a work. So they had to create a work before okay mm -hmm. um so that again sort of made them think in a different way yeah. and then um come and just just explore what it meant to really contend with the stage trying to give them as best uh, uh highest production values that we could and um trying to let them find their own way artistically right yes. and trying to and we kept encouraging and we still encourage them to take risks okay Wonderful. take artistic risks to see, so if, if you think something is not what you, you know, what your other friends are doing, that's fine. Try it. It's an experiment. Okay. Right. That's how you figure out your own aesthetic. And, oh, and that, yeah, and that, that piece, actually, the one that we just saw the picture of, that one is called VAPS. And that again is rooted in history. VAPS in Trinidad and Tobago means doing something on a whim, suddenly. On a whim, whatever, right. About, right. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Catch a vaps. Catch a vaps. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Caught a vaps. You just caught this fanciful moment, yeah. right? A caught a vibe and you just went with it, right? right. But what so I there's did. There's elements of spontaneity, of exactly, adventure. Exactly. Right. So you see the dancers there, and they are actually, they, half of the, the piece is maybe about 12 minutes long, and half of that piece, they're shuffling on the floor. And they're doing all sorts of interesting sounds and movements, but they're just really shuffling on the floor. And that's because I actually rooted it in what Guadeloupe has as the Goka. Goka. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, Lena Blue, who's a, a, a very yeah. well-known well proponent of the, um, the technique. The indigenous technique. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I based it on her movements, on her, Wonderful. yes. So you have a sense of, of the big D, sort of the big D, exactly. <laughs> and so wow. I had to tell the dancers about the big D, oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. And we we based the dance on that. And once they did that and they embodied that, you know, the sky oh, was the limit. And incredible. I'm so I'm really happy to also to say that this piece has been selected as one of the pieces that is being studied at the Cape examinations throughout the region now. And I think, <laughs> thank you, because again, it speaks to the Caribbean type of aesthetic um, yeah. and the ca and Caribbean impulses, because you know everybody has a different way of approaching things. But the fact yeah. is that still, I think people can see the Caribbean ness in it, and that's one of the things I it's try incredible. to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's incredible just even to think about that connectivity across the linguistic divide. There's a way that I think the arts have been more successful than even aspects of our scholarship where, where we're hindered by words that we can unpack because mm -hmm. they're spoken or written in a language that we haven't yet mastered or could unpack. But through movement, we, we, we are able to traverse yes. those blocks without any problem, you know, and yeah. so, even I remember working with Lena, and Lena was saying everybody has their own bigidi, you know. Well, that, this is that, good. That out of balance while being in balance, that moment of, of shift, that moments of, That's of so that, true. That, that space, and all that could happen in that space. Yeah. <laughs> because in in, his, in in the Haitian construct, it's called kasse, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. And in the Trinidad and Tobago construct, it's called a break. 
but it's the same it. it's the same percussive moment that allows you to suspend yourself in, in yeah. the moment you see be in that limbo exactly moment. so yeah. that is what i was trying to capture with this particular piece yes and limbo speaking of which is is also quite close to you right That's yes the, that liminality yes of, of, of space of time of movement of shifting uh, across of traversing, like right. you know, I was introduced to limbo as a wake dance, right? So I it's studied a, yeah. it as That's right. as a wake dance, and of mm -hmm. course, many would have first encountered it on cruise ships and those things as a tourist kind of mm -hmm. folly. Mm -hmm. But it's so deeply rooted in something beyond, um, something transcendent. What have Why? you explored and, and discovered in your own reflection on limbo so far? Well, I, I have a film that I did about 10 years ago, which was based on one of our proponents of, the, one of our greatest proponents of the limbo dance, but in the sort of cabaret setting or the nightclub setting right. um, called Julia Edwards. Um, but in my research for that, um, you, you come across these different narratives about how limbo might have come to Trinidad and Tobago. Right. And uh, certainly in, in particular Trinidad. Um, and as you say, it is a wake dance, but how did it get here? How was it that it, we don't really find it in Africa? So right. this brings me back to the sea. Did it develop on the sea for a reason? On okay, the on the ship. Okay, there are theories about how it could have developed there. With it, where, when I was speaking to the older heads of Limbo and the older impresarios of Trinidad and Tobago who used to promote Limbo as a nightclub act, they, you know, their mothers and grandmothers would have told them these stories about right. how the limbo might have come on the ship or because of that ship. Um, the things that, 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 were, that the African people were, were forced to do on the ship, you mm. see? Mm -hmm. So it is, um, that is, I, I, I'm, I'm not a limbo dancer. Um, I think my knees won't allow me to be a limbo dancer. <laughs> But I'm, I hear you. <laughs> but I'm absolutely fascinated by that whole thing because, for instance, the limbo of the of the wake actually starts with the bar high. High, exactly, and that's the night. And the, well, in Jamaica, oh, sorry, it's sorry, it, it, it's low. Sorry, low. it goes low and then it goes up high, up high. Okay, because you're going from the depths of limbo up to heaven. Mm. You see. But in, in the cabaret or nightclub tourist version, you go, it's more exciting to go from high, high to low. To high to low. Mm -hmm. Right. You see? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting how the, the, when you take away the religiosity or the, the religious aspect of it or the spiritual aspect of it, you invert the actual moment. Kind of the movement. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and yeah. Um, so that's that's an interesting that's an interesting um, development, but that still doesn't tell us exactly where it came from. You yeah. see, yeah. because again, a wake had to do with a sort of syncretism of between the African tradition and the the Christian tradition, the European Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. So that where does the actual movement come from? Come from, okay. yeah, because when you look across the, you know, those territories that would have informed our movement vocabulary mm -hmm. from the Gold Coast, you know, whether Yoruba Fon, mm -hmm. uh, Ewek, uh, Akan, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. moving into the Bantu traditions. Yes. The Bantu comes closest with their Congo cruciform and that yes. idea of the, because when you look at limbo dancers moving from their umbilical cord, as that source, like really yes. uh, trained dancers who, yes. who make that connection and then they lower from there, yes. that, that center, right? That, that becomes mm -hmm. um, where the medicine is, that links right. you between and where within at least a Congo cosmology, the mm -hmm. two spheres of existence, the living and the dead, exactly. descending into that Kolunga, that mm -hmm. Kalunga, mm -hmm. uh, that were where the Haitians were called the traversing through Guinea or to mm -hmm. Guinea. Mm -hmm. It is traversing through the bellies of the water across the Kalunga yes. line to then come to the other side. Yes. So there's just so, but interestingly in the, the traditional Bantu dances that I've seen um, both in studio and in kind of traditional setting, it's mm -hmm. more upright and it's circular. So the, yes. you see this circular action, you see it in Kumina yes. for sure. Yes. But this kind of lowering and crossing, mm -hmm. that's, that's the diasporic reality, mm -hmm. right? Uh, 
definitely a new world, if we will, invention in terms of based on our own history. So how right. we got here and then the the belief, the kind of cosmologies that help us understand our return. Mm -hmm. So much is also about how do we return to where we were taken right. from. Exactly. And I, I find Limbo presents such amazing possibilities to explore mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that continuum in a, in yes. a very broad term. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. So uh, it's, it's really an ongoing conversation, you know, as yeah. many of these movements are. I mean, you know, you find every, every year, I, you know, I find out something different about some dance movement, you know, or mm. some of the origin of it. It's just fascinating. There's, there's just, it's just a whole gulf of information, you know, it's, it's and wonderful. And it's to get in the trenches and to do the work. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Before I get into uh, your, your, your present engagement and work, I just mm -hmm. wanted to remind our listeners uh, near and far, uh, please feel free to post your questions because we will have time about 15, 20 minutes towards the uh, end of our program to begin to really engage further with Sonia. So please uh, don't hesitate to post those questions in our chat. But I, I wanna take us now to Sonia Madras. Ah. Right? <laughs> this, this, uh, and if we could bring up our final image, but this, this cloth that echoes across this region in so many ways, you know, I was just thinking when I saw it, I'm like, huh, the only space that I could think of in the region where it isn't as present would be the Hispanophone Caribbean. Right. Um, from, right. The, from the Dutch, the French, the English, you know, and there, there is a reason for that too, in terms of mm -hmm. that, those kind of colonial linkages and the commercial linkages um, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. But what brought you to Madras and, and what is this, um, your um, mapping? of the Madras and, and so that's one part. And then what does this mean for you aesthetically as, a, as part of your engaged practice as an activist, as an advocate, as, uh, as part of your advocacy and as part of your politics? Right. Well, what brought me to Madras is dance again initially because in a lot of the folk dances of a lot of the region, including Trinidad and Tobago, you would find that the Madras is part of the traditional wear as the, what we call in Trinidad, the overskirt, right? Uh -huh. so it's a skirt that goes over the white skirt and it's open in the front and you manipulate it with your, with your hands. Like what you would see in ballet. Exactly, mm -hmm. Bele and Pique, and you also have different uh, 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 accessories like the fula, which is the is the uh, scarf, yeah. and then you might have a head tie, um, either with the accent of the madras or the whole head tie is madras with an accent of a solid color. Mm -hmm. So um, that is what you know. That's where my awareness of madras began, um, and, and you know I've been to Martinique countless times as Guadeloupe also, but more so Martinique. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't walk through Fort de France and not see a set of shops selling Madras, selling right? Madras, the whole regalia. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I just found it absolutely beautiful. And I would, you know, buy all sorts of things, fabric, um, dresses, I even have some flowers out of Madras, you know, some, mm. some it's, it's really, it's, it, I just thought it was wonderful. And I, for me, it, it became very Creole and Caribbean, you know, yeah. that's one of the yeah. markers for me. Yeah. But what brought me to this particular moment, would you believe, is COVID. <laughs> because as you, you see on the, uh, for the picture, what happened is a friend of mine who owns a small business, uh, we were, I just called up to see, she, she, it's a sort of semi rough part of town that she has it in. And I asked mm -hmm. her, how are you doing? Is it everything is okay and whatever. I just called up to find out. And um, she said, look, I'm fine. I actually just made some masks for my employees uh, and they're out of Madras. And I said, you know what? I want one. I just don't know. I don't, there was this thing in me like, I need a Madras mask. You know, yeah. I'm going to have to, Cover it, yeah. yeah. You know, some deadly disease. I want a Madras mask because yeah. I'm in I the want Caribbean. To know why I look alike. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got a couple from her, and it then started. I started to interrogate my own feelings about how very much I wanted this mask, and why is it I wanted this mask as opposed to any other mask that I could have bought in a 
pharmacy or drugstore or something. Right. And it really was because it was, it's, that fabric is so special to me. And it's because, it, it, again, it's a signifier of Caribbean-ness on, on, on a very sort of deep level for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what brought me to it. And I posted something online with me in the mask, the same image. And um, people responded like crazy. They're like, yeah, yeah, this is great, you know? Yeah. Um, and because in the post, I said, you know, I, I want to take this a little further. I want to investigate the history, uh, the history of Madras, which, uh, of which I know a little bit, but not that much. Yeah. And then I also want to, to look at how it is was treated with in the sort of 19th century moment and then also the 20th and 21st century moments. Yeah, because yeah, okay. what you, I'm sure you're finding this kind of, uh, a, a kind of um, where it, it goes from an indigenous uh, cloth of, of, of othering, mm -hmm. right? this is what mm -hmm. the folk do, and then moving from this othering moment to this reclamation yes. when you have like the, in 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 St. Lucia where and in Dominica, the Creole day when people come out mm -hmm. brandishing uh, with, with such pride their madras, right? And so it's no longer you know in that kind of uh, marginalization of, of of these communities, but in fact allowing these Creole identities to really stand firmly in modernity, right? Firmly in their in the now in the contemporary. In a, but, in a, yeah, uh -huh, go ahead. Yeah, but what's interesting though is that I had a, I had my first sort of Zoom meetup yesterday with a lot uh -huh. of Madras enthusiasts, right? Yeah. And um, some of that, what came out was very interesting because people, some people are actually rejecting the Madras because of the bloody history with which it is associated. And the and the history of subjugation. So they're taking the contemporary moment actually to say, well, look, I don't want to be in Madras because it means this or that, which is a very interesting di development. Because here I am thinking, oh, it's all nice and Caribbean, and other people are saying, yeah, I'm Caribbean too, but I don't think that way, which I love because again, it starts to interrogate it as to where it will go from here. Yeah, yeah. And so while a lot of people, and, and on the other side of the spectrum, you, I, there was a young woman there from the Virgin Islands uh, and in the chat, I had in fact invited her to speak, that she is making the Madras, she's actually lobbying to get legislation to get a particular pattern of Madras as something that is going to be the official Virgin Islands, one of the official Virgin Islands um, sort of Declaration, oh, declaration right of, of their own patrimony of, and their patrimony. exactly mm -hmm. so you have you have these interesting sort of developments, developments that are kind of contradictory, and, uh, contradictory in moments yes but that is so caribbean it is it is it's so caribbean because from one island to the other yes we are we are here and we are in the sea between the sea and the and and the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. but on other, because we are islands, we have a way of developing our own approach to something that is, is certainly not, it's not it's not groupthink. You see, yeah, it's very and, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so it, it was it was a very sobering moment for me yesterday when uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, because you know most of the people were very uh, sort of they embraced the Madras. And a couple of them said, well, yes, we embrace it, but this is, you know, understand that there's also this theory about it. Mm -hmm. And um, there is, and it, it's linked to class mm -hmm. as well in some territories, in some, in some countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Very much so. And, and the kind of the, t the patterns in particular. Exactly. Uh, and the, the kind of the weight of the fabric that is used and yes. all of yes. that. Yes, yeah. because there are different types of madras. There's oh, a madras. very expensive one, and then there's yeah. the one that's much cheaper. It's almost like and, kente in that way. Exactly. Like kente of Ghana. Exactly. exactly. And know. then the, the whole discussion about the African fabrics that have been, you know, people think they're African, but they're really Dutch, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah, like when and you so, see, it's fascinating, like even in looking at Suriname, where madras is very... Um, popular among the maroon communities, right? Exactly. And um, and their, how they interpret and use Madras um, mm -hmm. spiritually, religiously. Like, so yes. for example, um, upon the 
when one is in mourning or family or community is, is mourning the passing of someone, there would be a madras that's dedicated to that yes. period of which people would wear yes. that the madras is a mourning cloth. And then yes. when we look to Jamaica, where the madras in, in revival is linked to the Indian spirits, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's also yes. linked as a national fabric. It's a national, yes. we, you, you don't see Miss Lou without her madras. Right, right? exactly. So you have exactly. those these interesting spaces of pride and of also negation and, right, and contention really yeah and but what i want to do with this whole project is to actually have an exhibition and it, i must thank the barbados museum and historical society for for helping out with the talk yesterday they're the ones who hosted it on zoom Absolutely. and also you know we're looking forward to maybe looking at this as a sense of a community museum a community exhibition yes. um, and so it will be online basically at least in the first instances in first instance because really and truly because of all those disparate views it's it it does speak, but everybody had a very strong opinion no, no matter whether it were it was negative oh, or positive oh, or in yeah. between or whatever everybody felt passionately about the madras wow. and that means that that's there's something in it that speaks to us as caribbean people because you don't hear that kind of conversation outside of the caribbean about that type of fabric Indeed. so um i think you know in the first instance we try trying to make a, a, an exhibition, which is a community of, 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 of combinations of, of whatever people think of it in their own spaces, you see? But we're also looking at the history and all that too has a very complicated history. It's not as, as, as simple as just the East India Trading Company having gone and got it and brought it over here for the um, Africans to wear, et cetera, right? Because there's a, there's a whole, there might be a connection with Nigeria, with Nigeria. there might be a connection with um, Madras itself and how that, that discussion, that dialogue between Africa and India happened long before the Europeans came into the picture. So there are all these different threads of history that speak to how we perhaps approach the, the fabric now. Right. So that's really fascinating, which leads me to the, the last question I wanna pose before we open up for questions. Mm -hmm. And it's speaking specifically about the Caribbean mm -hmm. and, and, and where you know you and how you center the Caribbean in your own creative work and practice. Um, how does it animate it? You know, in this moment, we're, we're seeing Madras, but it has been, it has been a drive for you. And mm -hmm. I'm curious in terms of how it has evolved over time. And um, and yeah, we we would leave that. Yeah, we'll go from there and then segue into questions and yes. see. One of the central sort of phenomena for me when it comes to the body, the Caribbean body, um, is the hip. <laughs> and um, I've spent a lot of time, I mean, I joke about whining and so forth, but I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to examine how we approach, how we speak with our hips in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's not just women either, you know, oh, because oh. Women, <laughs> As we know, <laughs> that ways, that's it. <laughs> I have a former student from the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and he has a class called Pelt. Okay, oh, <laughs> I did, <laughs> but um, the fact is that I, when you look at the Caribbean body, I mean, I've been trained in ballet, I've been trained in modern, um, and I, I learned folk. I learned folk technique to some extent, but I wasn't trained as deeply in that as I was in the other genres. Mm -hmm. But now, as you know, as I grow into more of my choreography over the, you know, it takes it takes decades and eh, to figure stuff out sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And um, so now I understand much more clearly about my own process, what's important to embody for my for me, my choreography and my dancers. And I think I locate that, I start at the hip and I start with the upper body, okay? And the way the gestures of the okay. upper body well, start to, yes, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I think those are the things, uh, regardless of 
ethnicity, okay, um, that start to be pointers for how we approach movement in the Caribbean. Indeed. And how the fluidity of it, I think, is what the, the location of the isolation of the, of the hip or the isolation of the upper body, plus the fluidity of it. That is what I think attracts people who are not Caribbean to Caribbean movement. Bringing us back to the water again. <laughs> there you go. I can't of, get away from it. I get away. That thing is, you know, yes. how we flow, how we yes. flow. How we flow, how we flow. And I think that is really what, what drives me in terms of how I, how I approach my choreography now. Mm -hmm. um, and how how I want to make it Caribbean as opposed because my, my whole the company Continuum Dance Project I call it a, a, a sort of lab a choreo a choreographic yeah. lab lovely. Okay? lovely and so we're trying to figure it out and I mean a lot of people I love to see the fact that a lot of people in the Caribbean are trying to do the same thing because that means that there's some kind of it's, sort it's of a moment it's a moment. So moments, yeah. You know, where your own body starts to take over rather than the principles of somebody else's rules or what have you. Mm -hmm. And I, I like, I mean, it's, it's very yeah. enriching. It's very and, and the idea that you don't even, uh, while we have that as a substructure or superstructure, mm -hmm. there is that knowledge that we have our own grammars. Yes. They're indigenous to our experiences yes. that we could then manipulate and build with and construct yes. amazing narratives Right, exactly. And we just have to recognize them. Yeah, see. indeed. indeed. <laughs> so let's open up and see if there's any uh, questions for you, Sonia, so, um, so that we could continue. Uh, okay, so we have here from Author Girl. <laughs> have you noticed a shift or impact as it relates to dance in Trinidad and Tobago? Um, comparing the creative landscape when the festival was founded in 2009, um, as opposed to now. So is there been a shift in any way or impact? Yes, um, most definitely. Um, two things have struck me. One is that those same young people who were very sort of green in their field in 2009, a lot of them have gone on to do different choreographic projects um, that, where they, you know, their confidence was built through Coco to some extent, and they, they've just gone on and done their thing. So actually, our mission was accomplished, or right. has been accomplished in the, on that level. In terms the of the capacity building. The capacity and building, definitely, definitely. Um, the other thing, however, I notice is that, and I asked a couple young choreographers about this uh, about a year or so ago, is that Coco has now become a, a, a place where people do quote unquote serious work. And what I mean by that is that they, they come with all these heavy, heavy um, topics and, and subjects, subject matter. And um, so I asked them, I asked a couple of them, I said, is it, why is it that you're treating with such a heavy topic year in, year out? And they said that in this festival culture, they need an opportunity to quote unquote, be serious at some point, yeah. okay? So I, I, I in turn say to them, well, you can talk about a serious topic, but you can be humorous. A lot of the time, yeah. even in college when I was, when I was choreographing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even in college when I was choreographing, they used to, they, a lot of the time, I used to be very humorous in my choreography with a very serious statement. So I used to be known as a sort of humorous choreographer, right? Um, and I treat with subject matter like race and class, et cetera, but through humor a lot of the time or through satire in the work. Yeah. Um, but I, what I did find, as I said, is that, that, that Coco has become a center of serious topic um, sort of generation. Yes. And, um, uh, so it's just for us to, to, to manage that. We welcome them because they feel that they, they can say this in Coco. They have a statement to make and they make it. Right. And, um, it's going to be different this year a little bit because, of course, this is um, uh, an online year and we've never had online before. Uh, okay. But it's, it's going to be, you know, I think they'll still approach it in the same way. Uh, uh, in terms of trying to deal with serious topics. But I just want to encourage people that, you know, it's, it's not, 
a serious topic doesn't mean, mean to that you have to have a serious dance. It can be. That's true. Yeah, because you know, and I think it, what it does do is it it takes away from the very criticality of the festive. Yes. The festive spaces are critical spaces, so yes. we only see them as spaces of frivolity. Yes, we, we don't get to do the work, you know, that emancipatory work that festivals allow us to do and to right. enact. Yes, so you know, it'd be wonderful to see how how those how much cocoa impacts the festive space of yes. the carnival and yes. vice versa in terms yes. of of being uh, symbiotic in that mm -hmm. kind of. Thing. But also inversing, if we can, right. in moments. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So any other questions out there from our audience for Sonia this afternoon, this evening? So we're waiting for them to upload. But it's it's amazing to hear um, just just that the, the the space, you know, using f the festive space as a means to to engage in another way. It's really. It's really important. So we have a question from Jonathan um, Van Arneman about how can we get plugged into this very important conversation on Madras? I, I hear, I hear, and our next body one join in. That's <laughs> you, that's you think? Like you think? <laughs> that's like an next body one drape up. Come on something. in, come on in. <laughs> we want all of these different opinions. We want everything that um, that will speak to the Madras. Um, well, Jonathan, there are a couple of ways. Um, one is I can give you my uh, one of my email addresses that you can you can contact me there. It's sjmd100, sjmd100 at gmail.com. And um, you can also contact the Barbados Museum and ask to speak with uh, or leave a message for Alessandra Cummins, who's the one who was able to put all of this together for us. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going, what we decided yesterday, in fact, is that we're going to just um, sort of as they say in the, in the soka, we'll wheel and come again, right? So <laughs> we're going to take some time in the next few weeks to figure out how we're going to, to start the, the sort of shaping of it as a community effort, Lovely. as a Lovely. Caribbean community. So if you have oh. any thoughts on that, please email me. Um, that's, that's just fine, thank you. And um, we'll draw that into the mix of, of, of decision-making. We also have to raise money, of course, because that, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> everybody, you know, where we are. <laughs> you know what has to happen. So it's gonna take some time. It's not going to be overnight. This is going to take months of planning, research, et cetera. Um, we were doing a lot of sharing the other day, uh, yesterday that is, um, about different publications or different um, books or what have you that might be important. There's a wonderful book by the young lady from the Virgin Islands where she has, she's a, it's, a, it's a book of, of photographs. Her name is mm -hmm. Chalana. Chalana. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, she's done these amazing sort of contemporary, I have to call them sculptures of Madras, Madras headpieces. Um, and she's then affixed different objects into the piece to sort of make a statement, you wow. know, it's wow. fascinating. So, um, and there's this, um, uh, there's an Instagram um, account called My, My Madras Official. It's not mine, but I just love it. I think it's great. Um, and because it, it looks at things Madras as well. So you could probably follow that. But yeah. really and truly, it's going to take, it's, it, this is the slow boat that we're taking because we want to do it as, as thoroughly as we can. Um, but those are the ways to, to keep connected. Great. Thank you for that, Jonathan. And uh, so from Amir Hall, uh, what would you say, Sonia, is the relationship between Caribbean waste movements and others around the world, such as African-American and African practices? Um, you know, that kind of, when you were mentioning your interest on with the waste, I, I went straight to Jawale Batimus of urban <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And, you know, and it's it's been, it's the center of so much of what we do in terms of our yeah. movement structure. So what, what do you see as that relationship, Sonia? I think it's the intent. Um, mm. What happens is that I, I have a, I think you could look it up on YouTube as well. It, it's a talk called The Hip as a Weapon negotiating power and identity in the Trinidad and Tobago wine, okay? 
And it looks specifically at what the Trinidad and Tobago wine means to Trinidad and Tobago, right? Um, and I locate it in the whole sort of trope of resistance to oppression. Because I, I even uh, in one of my academic moments, I had done a, an extensive survey of people and asking them, why do you whine? Okay. <laughs> and, you know, not a lot came back because I want to be sexy or sexual. It came back because I want to be free. And that's mm -hmm. to me, crux of it right oh, there. Indeed. See, yeah. um, there's a moment of freedom that is experienced by the person who's whining uh, in, your, in the context in which I'm talking about in terms of the Trinidad and Tobago history, post-colonial history, what have you, that I think is a, is a, is a, is a sort of a, a trajectory to liberation, to that moment of just feeling that- Just like a Lego. Like a Lego, you know? And that is, that is, I think it, now, is it the same in other cultures? I yeah. think it is, it, it could be in some instances, but I think it is also because I remember we all a lot of the uh, of the Bantu movements I think are the ones that we have really adopted as far as I my research has has told me in terms of the hip and the isolation of the hip and so forth mm -hmm. and so I mean we are we are not the the <laughs> sole repository of hip movements in, oh, in our yeah, yeah, yeah. but if you compare to say hula um, you know or the because there's sacred hula and there's also this the uh, sort of Present, presentational hula, if you will. There is the, there's belly dancing, um, which of course the hip is very involved in that. There's the African American um, movement of the hip as well. Um, yes, there might be similarities, but I think that in our in our space, mm -hmm. it has to do with that conversation about freedom and resistance. And, and I would add, if you, Sonia, even this idea of agency. The yes. notion that, you know, that kind of agential power, that a woman could be there whining on her own, a next woman could be with her, a man could be with her, and when she's done whining, she could just step off and walk, right? Listen, you know, like, I love that. See, I was like, whine. <laughs> whine and just be in it, in it, and, you know, you could take a piece yeah. for a moment, and then you go on through, and you walk on, and you continue, yeah. you know? Exactly, so exactly. That, that idea of, you know, transcendence, and agency, and power, and liberation, mm -hmm. that it's not something that's far and out there. You could exhibit it, and inhabit it in the moment. Yes, you know? precisely, precisely. Wow. I think that is that is our power right there. Indeed. So we have time for one more question before I ask you to for your closing thoughts, uh, Sonia. Um, so from Anna Lee, can you say more about your more recent shift into filmmaking, script writing, and the kind of in any potential overlap with your dance practice? So for example, how do these two art forms impact your thinking, your choreography, and your art making the cre your creative process? Yes. Um, well, aside from what I said before in terms of choreographing the film, using the rhythm, you know, in most practices, it doesn't matter if you're writing, it doesn't matter if you are creating something for a stage. And I dare say for the little bit of sort of costume making that I've done, etc., cetera, it, it applies to that also. You look, you're looking for the totality of something. Okay, mm -hmm. but essentially it starts with how you put the pieces together, the rhythm of those things together. Uh, I have a friend who's, a, he's literally a rocket scientist, right? That's mm -hmm. what he does. And I said to him, we went to, we went to college together and um, I saw him a few years ago and he said, I said to him, what exactly is rocket science that people have made this statement about, well, you know, it's not rocket science. What does that really mean? Because I want to know what rocket science is. Why is it so different that um, people say it's not rocket science? And he said, well, it was, in rocket science, you ha he was simplifying it, of course. He right. was saying that you, know, you have to make sure that every single part fits together just right and right. calibrated just right so that the rocket will not go off balance, et cetera, et cetera. I said, well, that's choreography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I think that it's not it, one always whatever I'm doing, be it 
choreographing, be it doing the film or what have you. I, I come from a place of dance and a place of rhythm of that nature. So I will use that as my foundation. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I'm doing the rocket science of trying to put all the pieces together so that there's a, there's a, there's a satisfying hole at the end of it, okay? Mm -hmm. The whole thing must try and fit together so that it is, I'm, I'm not saying people have to love it, People have looked at my choreography and said, I don't know what you were doing there, no, Sonia? <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah. Because I prefer that than you telling me, oh, it's nice. What does that, that mean? Yeah, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> if it affected you so much that you were puzzled by it or, you know, oh, God, what is that? That's too Taking heavy. Or, or, right. oh, it was wonderful. Then... I've done something to move you emotionally, which means the pieces were just right. Right. Okay. So we are just about out of time, but I do want you to share any closing words before I just announce uh, what's to come in this coming Friday. So you want to leave us with anything, uh, a kernel of Sonia that we could hold on to? <laughs> well, the advice I could give that, I mean, we're in a moment now that is very challenging. And what I've elected to do is instead of doing less, I'm doing more. Mm. I can't go in the studio, which is extremely frustrating, right? And I can't commune with my filmmaker friends and my and my dance fraternity as I as I normally do. And I'm sure a lot of us feeling that frustration. But use the moment to to go more deep and to mm. more deeply inside to to figure out stuff. Um, to sit outside. I mean, you know. I, they're right outside now. I don't know if you're hearing them, but they are set up. Yeah, the birds, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, <they're making> sure. <laughs> so I mean, you know, they 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 they're there for me to take pay attention to now and figure out maybe my next choreographic move. You know, mm. take, take inspiration by what is around you, not what you're missing, as that creative kind of of uh, use your creative spirit to the best that you can in this moment that is more than challenging for a lot of us, but. It is still something of, of where you can find beauty and where you can find yourself in a different way. Thank you so much, Sonia. And so with those words, those inspiring words, we come to the close of our first uh, set of discussions today, first with Jonathan and now with Sonia Damas, who's closed this out this Tuesday evening. Uh, I'd like to express thanks to you and thanks to all of our listeners and to our Catapult um, partners, the uh, the American Friends of Jamaica, the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative and Fresh Milk, again, for making this happen, for creating this platform for exchange. Um, please be reminded to join us for Catapult Lockdown virtual session number two, or three rather, at uh, on Friday, that's this coming Friday on October 2nd. We'll convene at 1 p.m. Um, Atlantic Standard Time. And this time we would be um, in the Spanish-speaking Caribbean with uh, Gina Jimenez Soriel the, from the Dominican Republic, who will be in dialogue with Helen Ceballo from Puerto Rico, as well as Sandra Vivas from Dominica. So we will be crossing our linguistic divides once more and having a wonderful conversation. So be reminded to lock in to our virtual lockdown salon um, to continue, to be continued on this coming Friday. Uh, so th thanks again, Sonia. And to thank all you. of you, thank you for joining us. And until thanks the next- Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay. See you. <laughs>